broadcast on this Wednesday afternoon, we're joined by a former NASA astronaut, the Apollo 13 Lunar Module pilot, who also went on to participate in the shuttle program flying the Enterprise. Fred Hayes joins us now. Mr. Hayes, thank you for being here. Good morning. A lot of people know the story of Apollo 13 uh, based upon the, the film that bears its name. In its early stages, did you have any concerns about Hollywood tackling the story of, or tackling the, the story of Apollo 13? Well, yes, uh, Hollywood does not do documentaries, which, you know, wouldn't sell. So, yes, I worried about how far they may extrapolate, uh, and they did to some degree the, for drama. But, you know, co compared to what I've seen they've done with other movies, uh, I thought they did a pretty good job. They carried, they carried the basic theme of the uh, challenge. Uh, we were in trouble uh, uh, portraying a, a team over a much smaller team been really involved, but nevertheless, a team that came together with the right people uh, to pull off what was a minor miracle and get us back. Moving into the actual event itself, were you skeptical before the launch? Were you skeptical of the decision to replace Ken Mattingly with Jack Swagger? Uh, no, it was an emotional thing. We had trained uh, with Ken. Jim Lovell and Ken and I were the backup on Apollo 11. So we had trained through a whole mission cycle as backups. And then again, trained uh, through another cycle as backups on uh, 13. And, uh, you know, it, it, I've served on back, backup crews. I was a backup on Apollo 8, 11, and 16. And what you do is emotionally, uh, if you're a backup about a month before launch, you probably figure the fellow you're backing up is going to not get injured or you're not going to get a chance to fly. So you, you mentally sort of back away from the disappointment that you've done all the same amount of work and uh, you're going to go watch somebody else fly. And conversely, the person, as I felt on Apollo 13, as you get closer within that last month, you begin to more and more, this is really going to happen. All this work I've done, and now it's uh, about, about to happen. Uh, so you're geared up, uh, ready to go. So it was quite a thing to change at two and a half days before launch. Technically, though, as far as safety or mission success, uh, there was no you could have changed out a whole crew the day before launch, and it would have been no problem. We all trained equally uh, to go fly that mission. In fact, backup crews normally got a few more hours training than the prime crew because they lost days at press conferences and you know other things they had to do, and we would just train on those days as a backup. In the film, um, it shows uh, Tom Hanks playing Jim Lovell, of course, getting upset uh, with Deke Slayton about changing out Ken Mattingly because he claims that Jack Swagger did not have enough time in the simulator as of as of late prior to the launch. You said all, all the astronauts, backup or primary, train under the same circumstances. They train for the same events. That's correct. They have the same. Yeah, that was, uh, again, the movie. Uh, actually, the meeting uh, was uh, with uh, Dr. Payne, who was that time head of NASA, and Deke, and uh, Jim Lovell and I. We, that was the meeting. That flight surgeons weren't involved in that meeting, and uh, Jim asked that Ken fly because the, uh, the exposure time uh, for the measles was such that uh, with the incubation period, we would have done all the uh, the landing, we would have done, uh, done the lunar surface work, been back together, and be headed home. So Jim said, why not just let him go if he gets the measles to that point? Measles is not life-threatening type malady, and what can be more comfortable than drifting around floating in zero G? So at any rate, that obviously was turned down. And we really couldn't, uh, uh, it was very drastic to restage a month, because you had to restage a month, wait till the moon swung around and got in the right position again, which involved taking the spacecraft all the way back to the vertical assembly building to detank it, because at that, the point at which this happened, we had already opened valves to wet uh, right to the, the RCS valves on the uh, service module. And uh, it, unlike space shuttle, uh, it didn't have drains. You couldn't drain the fluid. And those seals could not have been uh, left a month with that uh, caustic uh, propellant and an oxidizer against. So they would have had to pull it all the way back and actually cut lines to uh, detank it and then worry about welding. Uh, the lines back. So it would have been a, a, a really uh, concern about reliability doing that. So there was no choice. We had to go on the assigned uh, schedule. 
in the film, uh, we see Jack Swagger flipping a switch to stir the oxygen tanks. Seemingly a routine procedure. What caused the short? Uh, it was a, a routine procedure. In fact, had we not been staging the uh, TV show, uh, just to correct that part, that later led to an argument or whatever in the movie, I would have thrown a switch. It was, it was over in my position in the right couch, so I would have been the one to throw the switch. But what caused the short uh, is not specifically known because the components in the service module weren't recoverable. They, they burned up on entry. Uh, but what was suspect from the uh, post-flight uh, data that was looked at was the tank had been over-temped and over-pressurized on the launch pad to get the oxygen out of the tank on the ground. And uh, the thought is that charred the insulation on the wiring, uh, both for the heaters and the, uh, the uh, slow egg beater that was used to stir up the cryos. And so it was set up with insulation gone from wiring to have an electric shock when you exercise that uh, function. What was your priority after you heard and felt the initial explosion? Uh, and then did your priorities differ from that of, of Jim or Jack? I can't answer for Jim and Jack. Uh, the priorities were, pr I would say, were same. Uh, we were in a troubleshooting mode. Uh, we had had this uh, explosion. It was very obvious, a very loud bang echoing through the structure, vehicle motion to some degree, not violent, but uh, some up motion in the vehicle with uh, jets firing to try to hold attitude. So we knew we had uh, something seriously wrong. The only uh, manifestation from looking at the uh, panel, instrument panel, was we had lost tank two, oxygen tank two, because its meters, several meters were in the bottom of their gauges, which were also fed by different sensors. Unlikely multiple sensors would fail simultaneously. So we're almost assured we lost one of the two oxygen tanks. There were a lot of other warning lights on though. It turned out some of them were false warning lights caused by the shock of the explosion, closing valves that normally were open. Just the shock overcame spring tension. The way that many of the plumbing valves work, the fluid valves, was you had a toggle switch and when you toggle them open, it opened the valve and that, so you only used electric power for that function. And then when you released it back to center, a spring held the valves open or vice versa closed. And the shock G of the explosion had overcome the spring tension in closed valves. For instance, in the, uh, uh, the uh, fuel cells in the uh, RCS system. And that caused warning lights because pressure went low or the jets actually were shut off. And so we had like seven warning lights on and we had a master alarm, we had a computer restart light. So there was a lot of confusion. And our main uh, priority was to, uh, frankly, was to try to isolate the leak, which in a little while became apparent in the second tank, the only remaining oxygen tank. So there was a struggle which went on for about an hour and 50 minutes, 51, I think, minutes exactly. Uh, doing various things, trying to troubleshoot to save the second oxygen tank. Uh, just before that, I had actually left the command module to go get the lunar module powered up. That was the next priority, was to get us a, a ship going that could give us communication, could give us uh, life support, etc. So that was uh, sort of a shift at that time for Jim and I to get to the lunar module and uh, get it going. You said it was an hour and 51 minutes you were you were playing around trying to figure out what, what went wrong, how can we fix it, what's next, are we still going to the moon? That must have run through your mind. Uh, at what point did mission control go from saying, you know what, maybe this has to be a sensor malfunction, at what point did they actually believe we have a real problem here? Uh, it took eight, 18 minutes. For 18 minutes, they felt it was an instrumentation problem like something, a bad card in a electronics box, caution warning electronic. And that's, that was their suspicions because to them the same way they saw it, they got the same kind of warnings in multiple systems. And you know, you did not have a single failure that would normally cross systems. And those spacecraft were very simple. Uh, the, the computer only served guidance, nav and control. All the other systems were stovepipe or they were isolated each, all with manual switches or valves even, 
And so it's unlikely a failure in one system would affect another system. So it did make sense. And obviously same confusion for us. The thing we knew, we knew very quickly though, and when one manifestation of losing the one oxygen tank was we knew it was an abort. Or I knew it was an abort when I saw that, that we lost tank two. So I was just sick to my stomach because I knew we lost the landing. Um, after you realized that you needed to ration your electrical power, specifically what changes did you make? Obviously you shut everything down, or as much as you could, all the non-essentials, but how did you actually maintain positive radio and voice communication? Uh, well, we, we used uh, the limb, the lunar module. We shut, uh, well, Jack ended up shutting the command module down all by himself, uh, and mainly because the fuel cells uh, uh, all ended up failing and he was using up entry batteries, so they had to shut it down. We needed the entry batteries, three small batteries, 44 amp hour each, that had to get us through an entry at some point, you know, to get control the entry to get the chutes out, etc. So he had to shut it down. Meanwhile, we had got the limb powered up, and we, the limb had communication. Uh, it had environmental system, so it was a fully uh, had full life support. And they actually uh, did some extraordinary things to save power further. Uh, they had the, the big dishes around the world that support deep space, JPL mainly in their missions. They had them convert some of their frequency to our S-band frequency overnight. I talked to people, I knew, know people in uh, Australia uh, that still keep in touch with, and they said they didn't sleep that one night to convert their station to receive our S-band by doing that, we did not have to use our power amplifier in our comp system. So we were using about half an amp on a 30 volt system. So that's uh, 15 of uh, 15 watts. So we were powering, powering full uh, high bit rate and voice on 15 watt power for the moon. So it's, some things were done that way to get us down with the limb to about 12 and a half amps. Total power consumption on a 30 volt system whereas our normal low power point would have been about 35 amps. Fully powered up for descent with landing with all the radars and everything on, we would have been about 65, 67 amps. So we went down to about 12 and a half amps. I know you said that uh, the animosity that may or may not have occurred while you were with uh, your buddies up in space, uh, that may have been glorified a bit or it may have been exaggerated a bit by the film. Uh, the film specifically shows uh, Bill Paxton and Kevin Bacon getting into a fight over what happened with the switch. He's saying, you know, why did you serve the tanks? Why didn't you check the gauges? Uh, was there ever any animosity? Was there ever any tension, uh, either with that particular event or just in general throughout the seven days that you were in space? Uh, the answer is no. And as I said, I would have thrown the switch. There's no way of looking at gauges to say you're going to get an electric chart. Um, at one point, uh, I was looking in my research for the interview, at one point you said that you were able to save approximately 10 hours on the final leg home uh, based upon course corrections that you had generated with your computer. Explain how you did that. Uh, there were yes, there were course corrections not generated by our computer. We could not do course corrections in the LIM. It had to not, was not in its software. Uh, so it was computation by the ground. They did all of trajectory analysis. And what they did is after we went by the moon about two hours uh, past the Paracensian, and that was the largest maneuver we did using the landing engine, the decent engine, the limb, longest uh, burn of that engine. Uh, that effectively changed the shape of the trajectory, sort of cut in the corner that did cut 10 hours off the return. And that, that was good because it put us in the ballpark of our remaining consumables, both electric and water. Uh, so that made us have margin, in fact, when they, uh, when they affected that change. My next question for you is, is concerning the, the CO2 cartridges. The film shows you have circular cartridges in one and square cartridges in another. Why two different cartridges? Why two different shapes? Why are they not compatible? Uh, the reason was it was two different vehicles, two different contractors built by different people, Rock, uh, not Rockwell, North American Aviation at the time uh, uh, later became Rockwell. But North American had built the command and service module. Grumman Corporation had built the lunar module. 
So there really was no uh, overlap, or if you want to call it coordination or integration, between those two contracts and the development of those vehicles. Uh, you also said that uh, Apollo 13 had the second most accurate splashdown of the whole Apollo program. Explain how you overcame all of these misfortunes that really were completely out of your control, and you still come up with the second most that's like a bad approach, but a perfect touchdown. I mean, how does that happen? Uh, I, I can't explain it. I was so it's surprised because we abused the command module, uh, violated all the specifications by shutting it down, which it was never intended uh, to happen, uh, froze it. Water tanks froze. Uh, the water tanks were found still frozen when they recovered it on board the ship on the hangar deck and inspected it. So, it, but Jack uh, and I turned it back on, and all the systems came back up that we needed for entry. And as I said, that, uh, that's the data from one of the appendixes. If you look at uh, the overall Apollo uh, mission report, very thick document. One of the appendices, cut, well, several appendices cover a number of factors, but one was entry accuracy, and Apollo 10 was the only one that hit spot in the ocean relative to the ship as best they can track, uh, hit it closer than we did. So it was a, you know, I don't want to say a miracle, but it just says there was a lot of margin in the design of those systems where they were, they reacted and came back to life and performed uh, perfectly, uh, which was well beyond specifications. Prior to that, when you're still in space, after everything was powered down, it got unbelievably cold. When you had to power everything back up again, were you concerned that the condensation on any of the panels may uh, cause a fire hazard? There was it was concern uh, when we uh, when we uh, got back uh, in the, the spacecraft to power it up, which Jack and I did while Jim continued to hold attitude with the limb and communications. Uh, we actually had to get out wash rags and wipe off the instrument panel. So much water over the instruments to see. And we knew there was probably water around wire bundles and everything behind the panels. So we agreed that uh, when we started powering up, uh, when we were pushing circuit breakers in the panels on each side, we said, well, go, we'll only push, we'll time to go together and we'll push five, six circuit breakers. I think we said, we'll push six circuit breakers in and stop. And because normally if you have a short, uh, you can smell the insulation burning. It has a nice odor you can detect. So we said, well, then we'll proceed. We'll stop and then we'll proceed with another six circuit breakers. So that's the way we went through the power up. Uh, what I surmise saved us in that regard was the total uh, rewiring that was done uh, much more arduously to uh, maintain uh, the integrity of the wiring as well as the sealing at the connectors following the Apollo 1 fire. That was the fire that, where we killed the three astronauts on the launch pad. And the, the connectors and the wires into those 48 pin connectors, the larger ones, was hermetically sealed. I, I, I thought at one time somebody told me it was Melkor, until it was called Melkor. But anyway, that not only uh, served to uh, uh, properly uh, seal it, but also waterproof it. So I'm sure that's what uh, saved us from ever having uh, electric uh, shorts. What's the procedure? I mean, if you have a fire in space, that's that's a very, very bad situation to be in. You said that you would push in six circuit breakers and then wait, smell. If there was no smell, you would continue. If you did smell something, what would you do? We'd pull one of the six back out that we'd just done to isolate which one was the bad one and then selectively push one at a time back in to get which one was the bad one. You had a fire extinguisher on board, and there were holes all about that big, and the fire extinguisher nozzle could fit in the hole. So you could actually squirt uh, fire extinguishing uh, fluid or uh, material rather behind the panels if you had to. Many are, are, of course, familiar with Apollo 13. They're familiar with your involvement in that, that mission. You also flew the Enterprise. What was your involvement in the development of the shuttle program? Well, in uh, 1973, uh, I moved from the astronaut office back to the Arbiter project office under Aaron Cohen, who was the uh, project manager and later became director of Johnson Space Center. But I worked for Aaron for almost four years on that early development. I was on uh, 
started working. I was working on the change uh, evaluation board that evaluated the initial proposals for Space Shuttle that went through the government side process of selecting who would be the winner to build it. Uh, then I, I was on the uh, change board for all the engineering change work that was done through that early design. I chaired the ops uh, uh, group on all the design reviews through all of the shuttle from the uh, program requirements review, the system requirements review, uh, preliminary design review to a critical design review on the enterprise. And I served that same respect and that same respect through the design reviews on Columbia through the preliminary design review. But about that time, I switched back to the astronaut office. Uh, I was named as one of the two crews that were deemed to fly the, uh, the initial shuttle enterprise, which now involved a lot of first uh, getting our simulators. You had to check them out, both our moving base as well as shuttle training aircraft. Uh, we developed the initial uh, training plan, uh, all the initial uh, flight plans and techniques uh, to collect uh, the data that we had to on these flights, uh, that sort of thing, leading up to the eventual flights in 1977. Following the launch of Orion last month, uh, what do you see in store for the nation's space program? Uh, it, what do I see in store? It's uh, the funds right now uh, are in the front uh, are Orion, and the only other thing they have some money for that still has not even done its first firing is the uh, the heavy new heavy lift booster, which will be needed if it's, Orion's going to go very far out. Uh, so that if you look at the funding profile, and that's what counts, uh, that's about the extent of uh, what what's on the, the table right now. Um, do you think we need to return to the moon before attempting to put humans on asteroids, Mars, other planets, other celestial bodies? I, I think you do. It's just an easier thing to do and get a lot more learning, mainly about setting up a permanent station. Uh, setting up a permanent station and uh, learning about the logistics uh, and the uh, optimum logistics uh, way to support uh, that sort of venture. Uh, you know, we, we went to the moon, but we didn't stay very long. Uh, so I think uh, that would be an easier uh, first step. Mars is so much further away, uh, the, the, length of, the length of transit time, uh, and, uh, and obviously that would affect the logistics uh, uh, the concerns, other concerns about radiation uh, over a time, time period exposed to potential of that, both en route as well as on the uh, Martian surface. Uh, so I, I just think we have a lot more learning to do before uh, taking that bigger jaunt. I'd, I'd have to imagine that if you were to go in front of a congressional subcommittee or a hearing and, and make that claim that we need to go back and set up a permanent structure on the moon, many may say, well, we have the International Space Station. That's what we built it for. Mm -hmm. What advantage would you get by placing something on the moon? That's always a problem with Congress. Uh, Congress, as you know, uh, I don't think it has many engineers. It's mostly lawyers, and I really don't think they uh, have understood really uh, what a dynamic uh, technology program does in the bigger picture sense. And uh, it's it be it's a very difficult sell because obviously, like Mars, I've run into uh, congressmen, and and they have sort of added to well, Mars is not going away. Uh, why don't you go in another hundred years? It'll still be there. It's uh, sort of you run into that sort of attitude. I don't. I'm not sure how to get around that. NASA currently works with less than half a percent of the national budget. Prior to the 1970 launch, back in specifically 65, 66, NASA nearly had five percent of the entire federal budget at their disposal. What changed? What will it take for NASA to get the funding it needs? Do you think? I, I cannot tell you what will affect national policy. That's what you're asking. What will affect national policy? Uh, that was set up, Apollo was set up uh, by a combination of things of having uh, the Cold War and the technological threat uh, from perceived from Russia, uh, a president that wanted to do something that would offset that. Uh, I'm not sure Kennedy was particularly a space fan, President Kennedy. But uh, and I think he was offered several options of think, great things to do, and I'm glad he chose that one. Uh, 
as they uh, just create the uh, race to the moon. And uh, so, you know, we had to we had the capability. I mean, it doesn't matter what you want to do; you have to have the uh, the technology to pull it off. And we, we did have it at, even at that time uh, to make it happen. We did not have another major consumption of funds. Uh, later, in fact, Vietnam, as it built up, that's what erased uh, Apollo 18, 19, and 20. We were really to fly through Apollo 20. And NASA was getting budget cuts. So you can't buy with other uh, things that are consuming uh, large amounts of money as well at the same time, competing for funds. And so it, it fit, kind of fit that in that time frame. Uh, and I, you're asking me when all that's going to be aligned again. I have no idea. Do you think uh, if another country, because the, the United States is the only nation that's ever landed on the moon, if Russia, for example, we realized that Russia back in the 60s and 70s, they weren't necessarily ready to land on the moon. If that were to change today, do you think that might put a little bit more pressure on Congress, might increase the, the budget that NASA might find itself in today? It, it might. I just hope the con the con any country uh, does it. I don't think it's a uh, United States thing. Uh, it's a human race thing to proceed and explore and, and move outward. So I'd be happy if China did it. Uh, I just hope somebody does it. Do you have any, anything else you'd like to say? No, I, I, uh, my career, uh, I feel very lucky, uh, privileged to have uh, sort of uh, staggered into the right uh, career path, being a test pilot. Because I couldn't want to be an astronaut when I grew up. There were there were no astronauts. That I was uh, with the right background experience to uh, become a part of the program. And uh, Apollo was a very unique program. It was the premier uh, combination engineering and exploration program of the 20th century. So I just feel very fortunate to have uh, been around to uh, and, and able to take part. There's a variety of different majors that we have at Embry-Riddle. I just have one more question for you. We have thousands of engineers. We have the commercial space operations program that's starting to ramp up here. Everybody wants to know the answer to this. How in the world did you become an astronaut? Uh, well, that's, Other that's, than right people and right time. Right. There's two, there's two paths. Uh, probably the majority of astronauts today are on, or got there on a different path than I did. Obviously, space station is the thing today. So that involves uh, people who are more uh, scientists, uh, astronomers, all different variety of scientists, because the main job is to do, conduct uh, the experiments that are being done on the space station. Uh, the other path for uh, all through shuttle, early shuttle, and beyond were some people who operated the vehicle, namely the front two seats, which was the uh, commander and the pilot, uh, all had backgrounds. All had backgrounds in military aviation, uh, including myself. I went through military training before I became a NASA test pilot uh, to eventually get in the program. So all had military uh, flight training, uh, and uh, generally many had uh, again gone through test pilot schools or been test pilots. Fred Hayes, former NASA astronaut. Uh, Thank you so much for being here, sir. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.